Let's go ahead and get started. It's my pleasure to introduce our first presenter, Pamela Bridge. Pamela is the Director of Litigation and Advocacy at the Community Legal Services of Arizona. They provide legal assistance, advice, or representation, self-help materials, and legal education so that people know their rights. Pamela is an attorney and earned her JD from the USC School of Law. Pamela, can you please start us off? Yes, thank you so much for um, having me today. I'm now gonna share my screen. Um, Great. Um, so today I'm going to go through uh, rights and resources for tenants and homeowners right now amid COVID. Just a couple words we, when we're going through this, just to make sure we understand, especially when we're talking about um, evictions, that in Arizona, um, first the landlord gives a tenant a notice, um, then they um, can send them a summons and complaint. You can get a summons and complaint which means then that the tenant has to appear um, if they're going to um, not be in default at a hearing. Uh, after the hearing, if the judge finds that the tenant violated um, the law or the lease, the tenant then gets a judgment against them. Um, but that still doesn't mean that the tenant's locked out of his or her premises. After the tenant gets a judgment against them, the landlord needs to go back into court and get a writ of restitution, which allows the sheriff or constable to lock out the tenant. And that process, although I really um, shortened it, uh, is important to understand when we talk about, first, the governor's executive order, um, 2020-14. So it's important to know that that order didn't stop complaints or judgments. It just stopped and allows the constable or sheriff from locking a tenant out in cert certain circumstances that we'll go over. The tenant must still pay rent and comply uh, with everything they're supposed to do in the lease. Again, the landlord can still get a judgment against the tenant. So even with this, with the governor's order, tenants can have a judgment on their record, which makes it difficult um, to find other housing. So how does the tenant um, be able to keep the constable and sheriff from locking them out? First, they need to have a COVID-related circumstance and then give um, their landlord or property ma manager a notice of those COVID-related circumstances. And those um, circumstances are listed here. Um, number one, you've been diagnosed with COVID-19 and must be quarantined. You have been ordered to self-quarantine by a medical professional because of your symptoms as defined by the CDC. Someone in your household has been diagnosed with COVID-19 and you must be quarantined. You have a health condition as defined by the CDC that makes you more at risk for COVID-19 than the average person. The CDC lists those um, things such as pregnancy, asthma on their website. Also, you've um, you can have suffered a loss of income as a result of COVID-19, such as reduced hours or pay or circumstance, your workplace is closed, or maybe you had to stay home because your child's daycare closed. Um, it's important that when you give a copy to your landlord of that note of the circumstance that you also keep it. Um, a copy and it can be sent to your landlord by email or fax. Um, but you also need to make sure you keep that so when the constable comes, if the landlord does get the writ of restitution and the constable comes to your door, that you can show that you gave um, a copy of this notice and any available documentation you have supporting this COVID-related circumstance to your landlord and you can show that to the constable. So a copy of the notice that you could give your landlord and you're not required to use this notice is on our CLS website in English and Spanish. It just spells out the different options. But again, you have to give the notice and any available documentation. And that could be things like an email from the daycare that said that they are closing. Uh, your pay stubs before COVID and after COVID. Um, it could be something from the doctor 
um, which we also have forms on our website saying that you have COVID-19 and you need to be quarantined. You can see a lot of those samples that we've put on our website that you could use. So some tips about this. Right now um, in Arizona, all of the courts are doing things differently. So if you receive a summons and complaint, like I told you that first step, then the first thing a tenant needs to do is to call the court um, before their court date, confirm, confirm the court date, and then find out how they're required to appear. Most courts in Maricopa County are um, doing their hearings by telephone. Some will give you a, a number or a time to call, but you really want to clarify that with the clerk before your hearing date. Some courts are requiring that you send any paperwork, you email or fax it 24 hours in advance. Some have a box outside you can drop things off. So it's really important. We have 26 uh, different justice courts in Maricopa County and you, it's important to reach out to the court and find out how they would like you to appear for your hearing. As I said, you want to keep a copy of any of the documentation that you gave your landlord um, so that you can show the constable the constables are aware of the executive order, um, and, and sometimes there's some constables that will tell the tenant, well, you're quarantined, what well, can you show me that notice? If the constable still intends to lock you out and you feel that you um, showed adequate notice and available documentation to your landlord, then you really should at that point um, seek legal counsel immediately because once you're locked out, um, things get much more difficult. Um, so. Something that's a little bit different, I'm sorry, than now than we've had before too, are they call them motions to compel. And a motion to compel is when a landlord files um, this motion with the court because they do not want the tenant to receive that delay um, in the interest of justice. So maybe the landlord um, did receive notice from the tenant that they have COVID related circumstance um, the landlord can file with the court a motion to compel that says even basically if they have um, that COVID related circumstance, it's in the interest of justice not to allow um, that tenant to remain um, on the premises. So the tenant must receive notice. So it's important that tenants know that you might be getting a summons and complaint but you also might be getting a, um, a copy of a motion to compel and a hearing date on that motion to compel. This is something new that's only for this COVID-related um, circumstances under the executive's order. It's also really important to know that in Maricopa County, um, the judges have stated that at that hearing, the standard and the burden are on the tenant to show by a preponderance of the evidence that they have that COVID related circumstance. So even though the tenant was only required to show available documentation to the constable, if they're gonna win that hearing, um, they're gonna need to show every possible thing that they can get. So that may mean reaching out to your employer or your doctor um, and getting those documentations. Just the notice to the landlord that you have a COVID related circumstance is not gonna be enough. You're gonna to have to come up with more documents, more page stubs to show that judge. Um, it's also really important to know that, as I said, there are a lot of these hearings are by phone. Um, and so some courts are requiring all documents to be faxed before the hearing. So if you get a motion to compel, you wanna fax, find out what you're supposed to do and fax and email all the documents and proof you have to the court in a timely matter. So if the tenant does get a delay, um, and either they win their motion to compel or the landlord doesn't file a motion to compel, the delay lasts all the way to July 22nd. At the very beginning, we thought maybe the delay is a week or two. The delay lasts all the way to July 22nd. And during that time, the tenant still has to pay rent. So we've been asked a lot, what happens on July 23rd? Well, technically all those tenants who were locked out, um, who got the delay could be locked out without further notice. So what should those tenants do right now if they have that delay and they don't want to be locked out on July 23rd? They should go and talk to their landlords. That's always the first step for all of these things and try to work out an agreement in writing to be able to stay. Um, so we, that's what they need to be doing. 
Um, and then they can also be thinking about rental assistance, and we'll go over that in a second. The second big protection for tenants right now is the CARES Act. And it applies to tenants who um, are in many of the federal subsidized programs or tenants who live in properties with federally backed mortgage. So how would you know if your landlord has a federally backed mortgage? Well, luckily there are some websites right now, like the one that I'm listed, um, that you can put your address in and it will tell you um, if there's a federally backed mortgage um, on that property. So for all of these tenants who either are in a federally subsidized program or live in a property with a federally backed mortgage, they have a bigger protection um, than even under the governor's order. Um, for these tenants, landlords cannot charge them late fees or file evictions against them for non-payment of rent. Um, when we talk about subsidized housing, some people, you know, they think public housing or Section 8, but uh, the CARES Act applies to lots of different types of subsidized housing in our state, um, including low-income housing tax credit. So these are thousands of tenants um, throughout our state that have this protection. Now, they can be evicted for other things besides non-payment of rent, um, but they cannot be evicted um, for non-payment of rent or even charge late fees. So tips for these tenants. Um, number one, tell your tenant, tell your judge, if you get a non-payment of rent that you, that you live in a subsidized program. Currently in Arizona, complaints have to state whether the tenant lives in subsidized housing. So that's a clue. Um, you need to keep paying rent, um, spend some time and find out if your property is in a federally backed mortgage. Um, and, and then if, Eve, if you're still getting evicted for non-payment of rent, it's really important probably to seek legal advice like CLS or DNA or SALA, um, our, part, um, our other legal services um, organizations in the state. So how long does the CARES Act last? Um, the CARES Act for tenants lasts until July 25th. However, it also says that the, the earliest tenants can be um, terminated from their property is August 25th. So even though we have all these July dates coming, the earliest the tenants um, could be kicked out who are protected under the CARES Act is um, August 25th. So let's talk about rental assistance because I keep saying we gotta keep paying rent no matter what because the landlords need their rent. Um, there's no waiver of rent for any tenant right now. Um, so if the tenant has already applied for rental assistance from the Arizona Department of Housing and they were probably they were assigned like a cap agency and they didn't hear back or they don't know what happened, they should follow up. Uh, call them, see what's going on. Um, however, uh, if you haven't applied for rental assistance with the Department of Housing, it's probably best not to ask for those funds right now, but to go to the next place where I'm telling you. Um, so lesson is, if you've applied for rental assistance already with the Department of Housing and you haven't heard back, call, call, call. But if you um, haven't yet, then you could, should look to these other areas. So the city of Phoenix and Maricopa County have received CARES Act funds. Um, it's gonna be easier, it should be easier to, to get these funds. Um, you can go onto these websites. For the city of Phoenix and the CARES Act funds, you have to have an ID. And the website for city of Phoenix is stating that you need to be lawfully here um, in, in the United States. There's also many churches like Pilgrim's Rest who can give you assistance up to $500, St. Vincent de Paul. There's lots of programs because as I said, it's important to pay whatever rent you can because that rent obligation is not going to go away. So at the same time, tenants have protections. There are lots of protections right now for, I'm sorry, for, um, for homeowners. First of all, uh, when the CARES Act was signed in March, uh, all federally backed mortgages um, could not be foreclosed for 60 days. And that was extended um, to August 31st for Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, VA, and USDA if it's a single family guaranteed load program. Um, however, USDA World Development Loans and 184 Indian um, Loans actually end today, July, June 30th. Um, so for those types of loans, uh, they could um, 
receive foreclosures starting beginning tomorrow with the process. Um, but for everyone else that we've listed here, they cannot, there can be no, no foreclosures at all for those other federally subsidized, I mean, federally backed mortgages until August 31st. The other thing um, that the CARES Act did is it said that if you have a federally backed mortgage, you could receive 180 days forbearance um, if you request it. You just have to attest to it. Unlike the governor's order, you don't have to show documentation. You just have to attest that you have a COVID-related hardship to be able to get that forbearance. Uh, principal, escrow, and interest keep going. Um, you will have to pay these payments. Uh, you're just being forbear during this time of COVID-related hardship. So if you can pay, you should pay. Um, and so uh, it's because at some point this is still going to be due. Uh, beginning July 31st for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, let's just say that you've received your forbearance and now um, your COVID-related circumstances are over. Um, so instead of just having to pay all of the mortgage that you owe at one time, at one point, you can receive a COVID payment deferral program, and I'm trying to finish up really fast, that you, you just have to make sure that um, beginning March 1st, you are less than 30 days delinquent and you can pay your pre-forbearance payment. So right now, if you're uh, getting out of your forbearance, but you're afraid that you haven't paid in several months and you don't wanna have to pay that all at once, you need to reach out to uh, your mortgage, like reach out to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And then finally, um, mortgage assistance. Uh, if you need mortgage assistance, and like I said, we want to keep trying to pay if you can, because you don't want to end up with this gigantic payment due, um, that you can apply to Save Our Home. That's on the Department of Housing's website. Um, there are other programs too, but and this is just one of the many great programs where you can get foreclosure assistance. All right, I did it. Um, and then we will take questions at the end, correct? That's correct, Pam. Thank you so much. And um, for those of you who are vigorously taking notes, we will be sending these slides out at the end of the, or after this webinar. So we will post, you will have access to all this information at a later time. Our next presenter is Joan Service, who is the Executive Director of the Arizona Housing Coalition, a merger of the Arizona Coalition to End Homelessness and the Arizona Housing Alliance. The Arizona Housing Coalition is a statewide advocacy organization whose mission it is to be collaborative association, a collaborative association leading in efforts to end homelessness and advocate for a safe, affordable homes for all Arizonans. The Arizona Housing Coalition is also the proud home of the Arizona Veterans Stand Down Alliance, a statewide effort to connect homeless and at-risk veterans with the services they need. Jones, Joan has over 20 years of experience in program coordination with a focus on educating the community about issues of social need through state, federal, legislative advocacy, community organizing, coalition building, and public relations. Joan holds a bachelor's degree in political science and a master's degree in public administration from both ASU. Joan, take it away. Thank you. Um, first, I want to say thank you to Representative Gallego and his team for having me here. And thank you to Pam Bridge from CLS for her presentation and the work that she's doing. Um, as we go through this conversation, I, I find it helpful to, as we talk about the needs, the demands, and the pol policy solutions to set the stage a little bit about um, the issues of homelessness and the lack of affordable housing in our community. Uh, next slide. If you can harken back to a time before the period we're in, kind of a pre-coronavirus, pre if you will, uh, we do know that over half a million people are living on the streets or in shelters in America. And this is a condition, a public health crisis in and of itself that we cannot accept. Next slide. In Arizona, there are 10,979 people living on the streets or in shelters in our state. This number comes from a point in time street and shelter survey count done in January of each year, so before COVID-19, and represents an almost 10% increase from last year. Next slide. 
In Maricopa County alone, noted as one of the fastest growing counties in the nation, there was an 18% increase in people living on the streets in just the last year and a staggering 192% increase since 2015. As home and rental prices increase, so has the cost of living, utilities, healthcare, childcare, and so much more, resulting in far too many Arizonans being forced out of their homes and the stability provided by safe, stable housing. Next slide. A report released by our organization and the National Low Income Housing Coalition reveals that on average, a full-time worker in our state must earn $19.52 an hour, which is the hourly wage needed to afford a modest rental home without spending more than 30% of his or her income on housing. The report shows that housing costs are out of reach for far too many individuals average renters, millions of low-wage workers, seniors, and people living with disabilities living on fixed income. This also means that an, a minimum wage worker in Arizona must work 57 hours per week to afford a modest one-bedroom apartment. And if that minimum wage worker is a single parent, they must work 70 plus hours per week to afford a two-bedroom rental home and they'd be further pressed to put food on the table, find safe, ch safe childcare and access preventative healthcare. In no state in America, even those where minimum wage has been set above the federal level, can a minimum wage renter work just a 40 hour work week and afford a modest two bedroom rental home. Next slide. Arizona's rental housing supply can only meet a quarter of the state's needs. The state has just 26 affordable and available rental homes for every 100 extremely low income rental households. Only two other states, our neighbors in Nevada and California, have a greater shortage. In the decades since the 2008 housing recession, Arizona's once plentiful supply of cheap housing has completely dried up. Budget shortfalls forced the state to slash funding for rental assistance, eviction and homeless prevention programs have shut down and other programs have built year-long wait lists driven by a sudden and overwhelming de demand. The affordable housing crisis has swept over all of America, but the shortage effect has particularly devastated the Southwest, where explosive population growth and rapid real estate development have hollowed out our supply of cheap housing. Next slide. As was mentioned, the Housing Coalition works to advocate for safe, affordable homes for all Arizonans. We're committed to securing funding that meets the needs of our members, especially during these challenging times. Lawmakers know our advocacy demands represents the needs of more than 200 organizations that span the entire state. Pre-COVID-19, our work centered around seeking a greater state investment in affordable housing and addressing homelessness. Arizona jo joins many other states when they created a state housing trust fund, a fund made of ongoing dedicated sources of public funding to support the preservation and production of affordable housing and increase the opportunities for families and individuals to access these homes. Arizona's housing trust fund is funded by the sale of unclaimed property. Other states fund their housing trust funds with taxes and fees associated with real estate transfer tax, document recording fees, and the like. Unfortunately, our housing trust fund was swept during the 20, 2008 housing bust. Working with our state lawmakers, the coalition was, was successful in receiving a one-time infusion during the 2019 state legislative session, but one-time funding does not get people into homes and, and have housed. Governor advocating $5 million from our state housing trust fund to bolster the Department of Housing's Rental Eviction Prevention Assistance Fund that Pam mentioned earlier. We'd be remiss if we didn't mention and reflect that had the fund been restored to its pre-recession level, it could have been more instrumental in keeping people housed and helping our neighbors without homes. Pre-COVID-19, we made significant progress with our state lawmakers on creating a state affordable housing tax credit which mirrors the federal program created under President Reagan, expanded and reauthorized by Presidents Clinton and Trump, which would create about 18 
1,800 construction jobs annually to build over 6,000 desperately needed of new and affordable housing units and create about a $2 billion, $2 billion in total economic activity in our state. However, responding to the public health crisis, our state legislators adjourned their work. The Housing Coalition remains optimistic that state legislators will take up the need to address housing insecurity worsened by the pandemic during a future special or next legislative session. Finally, we take action on legislation introduced at the federal, state, and local levels with the lens of how they impact access to healthcare, a livable wage, and affordable housing, which we believe are the three essential ingredients in the path out of homelessness. Next slide. Look, we were in an affordable housing crisis before the coronavirus pandemic began. It's only going to be exacerbated by this health crisis, further illustrating how undeniably linked these two issues are. Like many other states, the Housing Coalition and our members are working quickly to address how to blend and braid federal, state, and local resources to address housing instability worsened by this pandemic. We're working with local leaders to quickly stand up and bolster existing rental assistance and eviction prevention programming as well as support protecting people experiencing homelessness from acquiring or transmitting COVID-19. Homeless shelter providers across our state are on, the are on the front lines doing their best, but ensuring their success requires a greater investment and support. And our response must be duly focused. We must meet the immediate needs as well as address the structural deficits in our affordable housing supply to keep people stably housed and address the projected increase in homelessness due to the pandemic. But this is where our community, our membership, and our co collective thought leaders like Pam, uh, we have this, the skills and the ability. We know how to do this work. We have the data for practical solutions. We have the policy solutions. We understand the barriers that existed before the pandemic, and we are a highly adaptive and resilient workforce that can nimbly meet the challenges that this pandemic presents. The policy and funding choices we make now to weather this virus can lead us on a better path for the future that helps all Arizonans in our state in the pursuit of a safe, affordable place to call home. To that end, next slide, please. The federal government has funded $12 billion to address housing and homelessness through HUD. The state and its local municipalities will share in about $130 million to administer eviction prevention programming, emergency rental assistance, and support temporary isolation, quarantine housing, and sanitation supplies. That's some of the funds that Pam mentioned going to Maricopa County and the city of Phoenix. In May, the United States House uh, of Representatives passed the HEROES Act. Thank you to Representative Gallego for his support, which included $11.5 billion for the emergency solutions grants to prevent individuals from acquiring and passing the virus, and $100 billion for emergency rental assistance, not to mention a national eviction moratorium lasting for longer than a year. Unfortunately, the bill now awaits action by the Senate, who has taken a wait and see approach, something that renters whose rent comes due tomorrow cannot afford. At the state level, the legislature passed and the governor is now overseeing a $50 million crisis contingency and safety net fund, which has numerous in intended purposes, some of which address housing insecurity. To date, about $5 million has been allocated to statewide shelter providers, but again, ensuring their success requires a far greater investment. The State Department of Housing's COVID-19 Eviction Prevention Program, which Pam talked about earlier, has been slow to start and slow to allocate, but hopefully with increased media and legislative scrutiny, as well as some administrative requirements changed, the fund will be more timely administered to renters in need, including when the moratorium is lifted in late July. And then finally, the governor has rallied the philanthropic and business community to pool resources to broadly aid those impacted by COVID-19 through his Arizona Together Fund. And that's exactly what we need when it comes to the rise in folks experiencing homelessness and our affordable housing crisis. The business, the business philanthropic, faith-based, nonprofit, and all levels of government 
federal, state, and local coming together to assure that all Arizonans have a safe, affordable place to call home, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, but and beyond. And with that, next slide. I, I appreciate your time and happy to answer any questions. And here is my contact information. Thank you, Joan. At this time, we will now begin our Q&A portion of this webinar, and I ask that you continue to submit your questions. Uh, you can do so by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Some of you pre-submitted your questions when you registered, and we are going to get, go ahead and get started with some of those. So we will start with the first question. Um, and uh, somebody asked if we'll provide the PowerPoints after the webinar. As I mentioned previously, yes, we will be sending these out after the webinar. Uh, the next question is, um, it says, my property management company has been charging me late fees, even though we are in the middle of a pandemic and I've been working very few hours. Now they plan to sell the house we live in and there are no places to live in my town. How can we, a family of four, barely making it, get help? Um, this, is, this is Pam. I can take a, a stab first. Um, the, first about the late fees, just legally, uh, unless you live in a property that it sounds like you do not, like a federal subsidized housing program or, or with a federally backed mortgage, which might, might be your situation, uh, a landlord um, can charge late fees. They, the Landlord Tenant Act, all the rights and responsibilities uh, that we had before COVID continue. Um, and so when you're, now, now that your landlord is selling the place that you want, that you're living, uh, I think it's really important that if you can't afford, because when, when you move into a different place, um, you're gonna need to come up uh, probably with a security deposit and first month's rent. So if you can't pay that, I think going to those resources that we listed um, and try to get help is a really um, good step. I also think that you should try to avoid, uh, do whatever it takes to not get an eviction on your record. So if that means your landlord wants you to move out by a certain time, um, you should do that if you can, like work to doing that. And if you need extra time, try to work with your landlord and maybe get that in writing. Um, because getting that, as I mentioned, getting that eviction on your record makes it difficult um, to find other places to live and, and it can keep you from getting subsidized housing. So just going back to that, I would really strongly urge you to look at some of the resources that we've listed for rental assistance. The only thing I'd echo to that is that, um, you know, as, as these different municipalities are um, assessing and teasing out all the different federal and state funds available to address um, rental assistance and eviction prevention, it's going to take a bit uh, time to kind of tease out, so, um, especially since a lot of the um, government workers at these different municipalities are also now in a remote work environment. So it's just going to take a little, unfortunately, a little bit more of an administrative time to get them stood up and, and implemented. So I hate to say this, be patient. And I realize that that's unfair to say when you're in the midst of, a, of this housing crisis. Our next question comes from Mark. My daughter signed an apartment lease for 13 months. She is a cosmetologist. She was working full time and made good money and then was given part time because of the COVID closures and is not getting haircuts. How do I get out of a lease? We do not believe that COVID will end anytime soon and has, has had a negative impact on loss of income. Uh, just prolonging an eviction re is really not much help. Right, so how you get out of a lease, um, it depends on what type of term that you're under. Uh, so if it's on a month to month, you just have to give right notice. It's out, most leases are for a year, so you just have to give then the proper notice that you, um, before your lease ends. Uh, you, don't, you don't want to break the lease uh, if you're in the middle of a lease term, unless you can get your landlord in writing to let you out, because again, um, they can hold you for the whole time. They have a duty to mitigate, but they, you signed a lease, they think that like, they should be entitled to that, that rent during that time. It does sound though, I, that if 
there was a if there was an if there was an eviction because her um, income was lessened because of COVID nineteen, she would qualify for the delay in the enforcement, but she still would get the eviction on her record. So again, I would go back to looking at your lease and deciding when you're legally allowed to leave it, um, and then talking with your landlord. Thank you. The next question says, how long does it take to qualify for rental assistance and where do I get the paperwork? Um, as I was mentioning before, because uh, the Department of Housing has so many that they're still processing right now, um, that if you haven't put an application in there in the, with the Department of Housing, um, going to those funds that Joan discussed before through the city and Maricopa, that there's gonna be uh, less um, kind of hoops to jump to get rental assistance with that CARES Act funds. Um, and so I, we listed that web, we listed those. I, I don't know of the time yet, how long it's gonna take to issue those funds, but just by looking at the process, it looks like it's not going, it's gonna be a quicker process than maybe the state was able to do. Thank you, Pam. The next question is, how long does an eviction or judgment stay on your record? That's a really good question. And I, I think there's two records. There's, first of all, there's your rental history record. Um, and then there's, there's also the judgment that goes on your um, credit history. So there's two different records that landlords can look at. Um, if you pay for the entire, uh, if you pay off your judgment, you can get the landlord then should release that amount from your credit and that's important like if you if you have a judgment let's say for a thousand two hundred dollars and you pay that off then that then the landlord has a duty to the credit agencies to take that off your record how long do evictions stay on the rental history that's a good question and i don't know it but if you want to reach out to me i can look it up I, i'd like to know that too I would add that one of the, you know, at a kind of a 30,000 foot conversation, um, you know, access to housing is something that we're highly at attuned to and convictions and evictions are the two, you know, the two hardest barriers that we, you know, as a community and as a state, we try and figure out solution, policy solutions for, but uh, yeah, it, it's definitely tough and tricky. Thank you. This next question is, where can I get help with an eviction hearing? Who offers free legal service? Um, so community, if you're in Maricopa County, uh, uh, Community Legal Services, we're in five different counties. We are a nonprofit law firm. We do lots of different types of civil law, but representing tenants and evictions is one of the things that we do. Um, we only represent the tenant in the actual eviction if there's some legal think merit or something that we can do to assist. So we're not like the public defender where you have uh, somebody go with you all the time, um, but we will provide legal assistance. Sometimes we negotiate on tenant's behalf, but depending on what your need is and depending on what your legal issue is, we are free. Um, there are, as I, there's in Tucson, there's Sala, who is the same free type of organization that we are, and north of us, um, on the reservations, there's DNA, um, but that is definitely one of our five major practices is representing tenants and evictions. Next question is, if I have already been to court and my eviction is final, is there any help available to allow me to stay in my house or apartment? Um, First is that the delay might, if you have a COVID related circumstance, you could uh, be under the governor's order and show a COVID related circumstance and your documentation to your landlord. And that would keep the constable from locking you out. After your judgment, then the landlord has to go back and get a writ and only then can the constable and sheriff lock you out. So if you can, if you have a COVID related hardship right now, getting that documentation, showing your landlord, even, even if you've already had that judgment, you get to stay right now until July 22nd. Um, and so, but I always start with also just talking to your landlord. He does have a judgment against you, but maybe we, we've heard of many landlords who 
they're having a difficult time too. There, there's a lot of landlords that are trying to work with tenants, you know, and so communicating with your landlord is always the first thing to do. If you have that judgment that maybe you can make a payment plan to stay, start there, um, and then think about the governor's order also. I would uh, echo and applaud that that comment because um, both community legal services and the housing coalition we've really been emphasizing the, the the education around the eviction moratorium and the resources available available but also the communication between the two parties um, community legal services has excellent toolkits available and forms that you can download and use as you uh, navigate the eviction moratorium. Um, but I also mentioned that the Housing Coalition has a toolkit to, and I, I, I apologize, I, I don't know how extensive um, uh, CLS is, is, but it's a it's a tool, it's a form that, that seeks to have that uh, payment process mitigation uh, between the two parties and to come up with that payment plan so that everyone uh, can stay stably housed, that the landlord um, doesn't lose that vacancy because that's a financial impact to them, but that again, that that tenant doesn't have that eviction on their record, which is, which is a major hardship. Good point. Thank you. This next question is, if I were to apply for mortgage assistance, would this affect my credit? I was hoping to refinance right before I got laid off. Getting mortgage assistance isn't going to hurt your credit. Um, and so, in fact, it's a good thing to be able to try to pay and stay on top of those payments, whatever, you know, going out to any types of the mortgage assistance programs that you can. Um, and so we str strongly encourage you to reach out to those programs right now. Thank you. Is there any assistance to help homeowners with property taxes? That's a really good question. And I'm not sure that uh, that Save Our Home handles property tax, but they may. Um, and so I'm not 100% sure, but I, if, again, if they want to email me, I'm happy to look at that and, and uh, look further into that. That's a really good question too. Though I also have unfortunately a question mark to the to that question, but I will say that um, that housing counselors in our field um, are going to be that kind of financial first responder as we dig ourselves out of this economic devastation of COVID nineteen. So going to a housing counseling agency might be um, a good uh, suggestion. I, I know groups in, in Phoenix like Trellis and Newtown. Um, those are uh, housing counseling agencies that can not only assist um, homeowners, but also renters in, in trying to uh, find the, the best financial solution to their housing crisis. And they might have those, those, those answers about not only property tax, but maybe homeowners assessments that also might become that additional barrier. Good solution, That's a good suggestion. Thank you. Uh, this next question is, I have a verbal lease agreement with my landlord, nothing in writing. Is there any financial rental assistance avail available to me without a lease? Um, you can, under the city of Phoenix, uh, if you get a five, for most of the, the rental assistance to the city or the county, um, if you don't have a lease, if you can show them your five day notice, um, that's one of the documents they said that they can look at. So unfortunately, that's waiting until you get a five day notice. I would just like to encourage you to get a note, to get a lease in writing, you know, like talk to your landlord and say, hey, can we just get something in writing? Uh, you know, I can draft it. There's plenty of sample leases. There's toolkits that Joan mentioned too um, that they can do. Having a lease in writing uh, is really, really key. Um, and so, but to get that rental assistance, I'm saying, if you get a five-day notice, they will also allow you to access um, the rental assistance with a five-day notice of non-payment of rent. This next question is, are any mortgage companies offering any COVID-specific relief? Um, so the forbearance, and that is Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, FHA, VA, uh, they, first of all, they can't, you can't get um, any type of foreclosure until August 31st, but you can also um, get a forbearance if you have any COVID-related hardship. 
um, and you just have to attest to it. Um, for all of those, uh, all of those federally backed mortgages, you just have to go onto their website. You can, they show the form and you say, I'm having COVID related hardship and you can get a forbearance to your, um, to your mortgage payment. Thank you. This next question comes from Glenn. Are there any legislation efforts to forgive rent or fund landlords or on uncollectible rent that allows tenant to, a tenant to stay in the property? Uh, so there is legislation, not in Arizona, but being discussed in other communities. California, for example, is, offer, is looking at um, a tax credit to benefit the landlord to provide some forgiveness to the, rent, to the renter. Um, and that, so that landlord would uh, kind of apply that tax credit to, to keep that renter um, there and, and to keep the tenant um, or the, the unit vac or occupied. Um, the, there has also been community conversations about, you know, rent strikes, rent, can rent cancellation, um, but in Arizona, I don't see that, that occurring. Um, at the federal level, as I mentioned earlier, um, we ha you know, we're quite hopeful with the HEROES Act because it had a significant number of housing provisions that we were excited about. Um, unfortunately, the Senate, um, it stalled in the Senate, although our, um, the Senate is looking at some sort of COVID-19 stimulus package, which includes some housing provisions. And we're encouraged by the fact that our two, our two uh, senators, Senator Sinema and Senator McSally, um, have indicated support for some, um, some housing provisions, including strengthening the Affordable um, Housing Credit Improvement Act, which helps that federal low-income housing tax credit program, as well as um, looking at emergency rental assistance to the tune of about $100 billion, which would, which would be instrumental, would be uh, amazing. Um, but at this point, uh, where we're seeing action is in the House. Thank you again to Representative Gallego, uh, but we need uh, their, the, the other chamber to take action at this point. Thank you. This next question comes from Danilo. Um, hi, good afternoon. Is it illegal to collect interest on a rent payment? So you can, first of all, the landlord, if it's in the lease, can get late fees. Um, and so, but it has to state that in the lease. Um, anything the lease, basically, if the lease says there can be interest on late things, then, then yes, they can do it. But that's where you look. You look to your lease to see what your lease allows. A landlord just can't throw on late fees or interests if it doesn't spell that out in the lease. This next question is from a military veteran. Um, they are a military veteran with a disability. How can they get help? So I will share that um, I kind of a, a at a policy level, I think all of our lawmakers and all of our all of the housing advocates are pretty um, concerned about the fact that, and pretty um, resolute and, and and realist about the fact that we're probably not going to end homelessness. We're going to unfortunately just manage homelessness during this pandemic. However, the shining kind of star in this conversation, the silver lining in this conversation, is that there has been a significant number of, uh, of investments to address veteran homelessness and veteran housing insecurities. So um, uh, definitely send me an email because we have uh, folks uh, around the state working to um, not only end veteran homelessness, but also address some of the housing barriers that vets, veterans face. And there has been a large infusion of some federal funds uh, specifically around housing through the Supportive Services for Veteran Family Program. So definitely send an email, we're happy to make that connection. Thank you. Uh, so we'll take a few more questions. Um, so if you, again, if you would like to submit your question, please submit it at the Q&A button below. I, um, this next question says, if I get an eviction decision against me, will I lose my Section 8 housing voucher? Most likely. Um, and that's really something that you need to think about. Uh, try to avoid getting that eviction at all costs, whether it means getting the landlord to agree to a mutual rescission 
um, or working something out with the landlord because an eviction on your record is one of the reasons that you can lose your Section 8 voucher and, and prohibit you from being in many other types of subsidized housing. So we keep going back to evictions on your record, it's the worst thing, but it really, that it is a huge barrier, um, as Joan said. And so at all costs, uh, try to avoid uh, what that, getting that uh, on your record, like trying to avoid that eviction, whether it means moving out, turning in your keys uh, when the landlord wants you to, um, and trying to work out a mutual rescission of your lease would be probably the first step. Thank you. Uh, this next question is, what can I do if I'm behind on my rent, but my landlord will not speak to me to discuss options? That's difficult. Um, and so, like, as I was mentioning before, both besides the governor's order and the CARES Act, the Landlord Tenant Act just continued, right? And so, landlords are entitled to their rent. Um, and so, if you don't pay the full amount of rent and you can't pay the full amount of rent, they are um, allowed to begin eviction proceedings. There is one protection for tenants um, that if the landlord accepts any part of your rent and doesn't have you sign a waiver saying, I'm taking your rent, part of your rent, but I'm still gonna be able to evict you, that for that month, the landlord cannot evict you. It's like a one of these defenses. So if he takes if the landlord takes any part of your rent um, for a month, you can't be evicted for non-payment of rent that month. Um, that's not a long-term solution. Like th that's what we usually tell people to do, like just to try to prevent that from happening right at that moment. Um, and so the other thing to do probably I would think about is documenting your attempts to try to pay rent to your landlord, um, trying to reach out uh, in writing through emails or texts um, to your landlord as much as you can. Thank you. And this will be our final question, uh, given the amount of time we have. But again, we will get to those questions after this uh, webinar. We will be following up with any questions we don't get to. So this final question is, if the governor doesn't extend the stay of evictions, can cities do their own moratoriums? The city can't, um, because of legislation, the city can't make a law that uh, it violates the landlord tenant act. Um, and so if right now, uh, if the landlord tenant act says that you can, you know, you don't pay your rent, you can take you to court, um, a city won't be able to deny a landlord that ability. Um, and, uh, there can be other types of programs, you know, throughout the country, there's eviction diversions that some programs are uh, are beginning. There's all kinds of things, I know, and I think we need to start thinking outside the box, too. So making sure landlords are getting paid and tenants are not having these on their records. So cities could do things as long as it doesn't violate state law. Thank you both. Um, again, that's all the time we have for questions. Uh, for those questions, again, we didn't get to. We will be following up via email. Um, you can also submit any follow-up questions to the email below, which is az07services at mail.house.gov or at our website, which is rubengallego.house.gov. And now at this time, I'd like to invite our, pan our panelists to give a one minute closing remark. Pam, would you go ahead and start us off? Um, sure, first I'd like to say there, are, like, there was a question about how long the evictions can stay on your record. I really encourage you to just e email me because I'd like, I'm an, I need to know that answer also. So please, that, for that person to reach out, I'd like to do that. Um, so I, I always go back to this theme. My closing remarks are that uh, tenants should always begin by talking with their landlords, um, no matter what, trying to keep that communication. It's a contractual relationship, but really at Community Legal Services, a lot of times we see problems begin when that relationship breaks down. Uh, landlords, you know, they have some of these mortgage protections going on, but they also are going through a difficult time so tenants should um, make sure that they're talking to their landlords, keep paying rent. As Joan said, tomorrow is July 1st. 
Some cities have rent strike. We don't have it. So pay whatever you can. Um, keep making sure that you're paying rent. Keep paying your mortgage if you can. Again, because at the end of this, there's, like, there's not a get out of rent free card for anyone or get out of mortgage uh, free. So do whatever you can. Call churches, call cities and uh, friends to help come up with that rent. Because um, again, we've, I think we've established the worst thing possible is to get that eviction on your record. And so, um, and again, uh, and please reach out to Community Legal Services if you need legal assistance, legal advice. Uh, we're, happy, we're happy to talk to tenants. Excellent. Um, what she said, but also uh, to say that housing uh, and civic participation go hand in hand. So kind of taking a couple steps back, you know, keep remain stably housed as much as you can. Make sure that you fill out your census form. Uh, register to vote. If you move because you, you need to because of a job or a, a, a cost situation, make sure you re-register to vote. Um, I know that I think July 6th is the voter registration deadline for the upcoming August um, election, which is usually where a lot of our um, you know, decision makers, that, 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 that uh, pool of candidates gets windowed down significantly in the, in the August uh, primary election. So definitely register to vote. Um, as we talk about um, our friends without homes, just be uh, just educate yourself. Um, if you want to provide support to our friends without home homes, educate yourself on what resources exist in your community, and serve as that that advocate for that individual. But obviously, um, you know, as as everyone is quor quarantining in home in their homes and, and staying safe, make sure you wash your hands. You know, cut, you mask up. All of the CDC recommendations. Um, we'll get through this together. We're stronger together. Um, and so just definitely uh, what we want to thank our elected officials and our, 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 our business community, our philanthropic community, and our partners like PAM and CLS and all these other agencies that are working hard to create that safe, affordable, safe uh, place to call home in our state. So thank you. Thank you, Pam and Joan. Uh, this concludes our Zoom call. I'd like to thank all of our, both of our panelists for taking the time out of their day to provide more information and resources. And thank you to all the participants who joined this call. Please keep an eye out on your email because after the call, we'll be, we will be sending everyone a survey and recommendations for future topics. This call was also recorded and we'll, we will be sharing this at a later date. Uh, be safe and everyone have a good afternoon. Thank Bye. you. Thank you so much. Thank Bye. You.